Uh, hello everyone, my name is Fergus Pitt, I'm a Senior Research Fellow at the Tau Centre. Uh, on behalf of the Tau Centre, I'd like to welcome you to the Brown Institute. Thank you for coming out um, and thank you too to our funders, the Knight Foundation and the Tau Foundations. Um, so this is a really wonderful report that you've come to the launch of. Um, Caitlin Petra's um, work has been very deeply done, very deeply thought, very deeply researched and the analysis that she's put together I think is really particularly interesting. Um, I won't spend too much time introducing it. I'll just tell you a little bit about the, form, the format of the day. Um, Caitlin will present the main crucial findings from her report and then we'll have three panellists come up for a discussion and we'll finish it up with audience, uh, from questions from the audience. Um, Caitlin Petra, I'll hand it over to you. Great. Hi everybody. Uh, thank you so much for being here tonight and welcome. Um, so I'm really excited to dig into this discussion with you. Um, and before we get started, I just want to say a big thank you to the Tau Center for supporting this research and pulling this whole event together. So Emily Bell, who couldn't be here tonight, but she has been just amazing. Um, Taylor Owen, Fergus Pitt, Liz Boylan, Susan McGregor. Um, these folks have just really helped this whole thing come together, and I'm really grateful to them. Um, and also grateful to our three panelists, who uh, there's like no people I would rather talk about this topic with, so I'm really excited about that. Um, all right, so this report is called The Traffic Factories, a metrics at Chartbeat, Gawker Media, and The New York Times. Um, now, I'll start by saying a little bit about why I wanted to study this topic of metrics and news ethnographically. Um, so it requires us to travel back in time to 2010, which was about a million years ago in internet time. Um, and this is a quote from Nick Denton, the founder and CEO of Gawker Media, and he said in a profile in The New Yorker, probably the biggest thing in internet media isn't the immediacy or the low cost but the measurability. Um, now obviously people, and probably particularly people in this very room, could debate that assertion for hours and hours, but um, I think we could all agree that the ability um, in online media to track users' behavior as they move through a website and to communicate aspects of that behavior as quantitative data to journalists is a hugely significant thing, um, and it's been really influential in the digital news world. Um, so nowadays, uh, just about every site has uh, lists like this of most viewed, most emailed, and so on. There's now a crowded field of news analytics companies uh, that produce metrics uh, to be used in newsrooms. And these companies produce dashboards that look like these um, that measure the performance of individual articles and individual authors, um, often in real time. Um, and so some of the aspects of online behavior that they can measure is uh, traffic sources, so where people are coming from, so what they're doing on your site, um, are they staying a long time, are they clicking on a lot of articles, are they scrolling halfway down an article and getting bored and leaving, uh, things like that, the, the, you know, uh, are the sorts of things that these tools can track. Um, and so these tools have become ubiquitous in, in newsrooms, uh, but that doesn't mean that they've been totally uncontroversial, and there's been a lot of debate. Um, one of these headlines, the BuzzFeed one, was written by one of our panelists tonight. Um, so there's been a lot of debate about what the effect um, of these metrics will be on journalism and on newsrooms. And there's been a lot of debate about what the right way to use this data is, what are the right metrics to use, what are the wrong metrics to use, um, basically what newsrooms should or should not be doing. Um, so we had a lot of that, but we didn't have a lot of rigorous research on what newsrooms are actually doing with metrics, and also we didn't have a lot of rigorous research on how metrics are produced. So that is analytics companies that create this data, that, that make decisions about what to measure and how to measure it and how to communicate the data. Um, we didn't really know that much about how they made those decisions. Um, so those are the sorts of questions that I really set out to answer in this research, and I did it by having kind of like a triangular research design, right? So first I went to Chartbeat, um, and Chartbeat, uh, how many of you are familiar with it in this room? Okay, many, many, many people. So right, so it's a hugely, hugely popular analytics service. Um, they work with 80% of the top publishers in the US. They work with publishers from 35, at least 35 countries around the world. Um, they're really everywhere. Um, and I was you know, really trying to understand how they made, how they made an analytics dashboard um, and then marketed that dashboard. Um, and then I went to uh, two news organizations, both of whom are Chartbeat clients. So Gawker Media, which is a very popular network of blogs on topics from women's issues to cars to consumer tech um, to celebrity gossip. And then the New York Times, which uh, I'm sure you all know, um, you know, very, very storied, prestigious news organization um, that, that is still considered the newspaper of record in, in the US. Um, so the first finding 
Well, actually, first, before I talk about my findings, I just want to say a couple quick things about the ethnographic method, because maybe some of you are not that familiar with ethnography. So essentially what I did at these news organizations was, um, well, especially at, at uh, Chartbeat and Gawker, I interviewed folks from kind of as many different places in the organization as I could. Um, and then I also uh, spend a lot of time kind of like awkwardly hanging around, sitting in on meetings, chatting with people, um, and you know, just trying to get a feel for what it's like to work in these places and how decisions are made. Um, and then at the New York Times, I did a bunch of interviews in the newsroom. Um, and so that's really what ethnographic research consists of. Now, uh, one of the things I want to emphasize is that I was really interested in these three organizations as case studies, um, which is not to say that I'm not interested in their specificities. They're all three of them fascinating companies. Um, but I really chose them because I thought that they were places where um, certain broader themes, certain broader characteristics might emerge in really sharp relief. Um, and so I chose them to be kind of representative of larger dynamics that we might see across you know, the digital media landscape, not just at these three places. The other thing I want to say about ethnography is that as you're getting to know these people and, and you know, really spending time and really trying to understand the work that they do, um, a lot of time goes by. It takes a while. Um, and in a field like digital media that's changing so rapidly, that poses some special challenges. Because just yesterday, for instance, there were stories about The Times and about Sharpbeat, uh, both of which have implications for my findings. Um, and that's not unusual. So I really tried to take the rapidly influx nature of this space um, and turn it into an asset. In other words, I really tried to get it to motivate me to kind of pull out and zoom out um, from the latest you know, newsroom management shakeup and the latest product announcement and really try to see the broader themes that define this space. Um, so that was what I was trying to do. Now I'll get to the findings. So first finding I want to present um, is, is uh, from Chartbeat. So during my time at Chartbeat, um, I was really lucky at the time I was there. The company was building and marketing and launching uh, a new version of Chartbeat Publishing, which was its sort of flagship editorial product. Um, and I was able to witness much of this process as it was taking place, which was really cool. Um, and it allowed me to get a feel for the company's culture and for its decision-making processes um, and how particular ideas and values get encoded in an analytics dashboard. So this is a screenshot of Chartbeat's dashboard. And uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, I'll just uh, walk you through a couple things about it that are important. So the first thing is that Chartbeat was really the first company to design analytics for, to be used in newsrooms by editorial staffers, right? So um, before they came along, most analytics were really repurposed from e-commerce, or they were you know, intended for use by ad sales folks. And Sharpie came along and said, well, wait a second, you know, maybe newsrooms need tools, maybe editors need tools of their own um, that have different metrics in them and stuff like that. So this dashboard is, is kind of a reflection of that mandate um, and a couple of the key metrics that it has. So up in the upper left there, you see concurrence. That's a real-time figure of the number of people that are on your site at the moment that you're looking at it. I mean, this is a screenshot, so not. But, um, but it would be moving. The needle would be moving up and down um, if it were really the dashboard, and the concurrence figure would be going up and down. Then there's engage time, which is the number of seconds or minutes that people are spending on average looking at your site. Um, it's usually seconds. <laughs> Sometimes it's minutes. But, uh, and then there's data about traffic sources um, and visitor frequency, how often people come back. You see there's stuff about mobile and desktop users. Um, and so this is, this is a dashboard that is just sort of like packed with data, right? It's just like uh, there's tons of numbers and dials and graphs. And as we look at this dashboard, um, it kind of presents itself as a kind of bloodless, dispassionate, rational object, um, whose mission is to kind of communicate data uh, so that you know, journalists can take it and use it and maximize their traffic or maximize whatever metric they care about. That might be engage time, that might be recirculation, or whatever. But, but that's kind of what, what the dashboard appears to us. Um, and it's not that that picture of the dashboard is incorrect, but it is incomplete. Um, so what I found uh, hanging around Chartbeat and also hanging around news organizations that use Chartbeat is that Chartbeat has really, really powerful emotional valences. It's kind of an emotional and a social technological object. Um, and that has implications for the way in which, uh, which metrics are captured and, and which ones um, and how they're communicated to journalists. So, um, so one employee put it really well. He said, he said it's not the identity of the number. It's the feeling that the number produces. 
that's the thing that's important about it. That's the thing that's important about the dashboard. Um, and this was somebody who was who was very uh, very sophisticated methodologist. So he really cared about the accuracy of these numbers. And he said clients kind of didn't always understand them, but that that didn't really matter that much because it was about the feeling that the number produces. Um, and Sharpie's understanding of the emotional power of analytics, um, I would argue, has enabled it to gain sort of a competitive edge um, over rival companies, right? Um, so they're in this crowded field. They're competing with other companies that are trying to get newsrooms to buy their service instead of Chartbeat. Um, and so you really have to do something as an analytics company to distinguish yourself. And this was one of the things that they did. So I'll give a couple examples of, of what I mean by emotional power. One of them is that when we think of metrics, uh, we often associate them with a threat to editors' judgment, right? There's this worry that editors are going to be essentially money balls. They're going to get the money ball treatment. They're going to be like the old baseball scouts who uh, were pushed aside by a data-driven approach to choosing players. Um, and that's been a cause of a lot of anxiety in, in the news world. And so one of the things, one of the things that Sharpie does is, is address that anxiety by communicating deference to journalism and journalistic values. Right? Um, and this was one of the ways that they distinguished themselves from rivals. Um, so Sharpie, for instance, refrained from making algorithmic recommendations um, about where to place a story on a website or when to produce a follow-up story, anything like that. They, di they didn't include that stuff in the dashboard. Um, and here's one employee explaining why. We had a competitor um, who made a tool that made suggestions to editors. And editors were like, I'm not using this damn thing. You're telling me to put stuff in the lead spot that I would never put there. So we said, listen, we're not taking away your job. We're enhancing your ability to make those decisions. So this is really interesting, uh, kind of from a sociological point of view, because Chartbeat did not include a feature um, that they could have included that would have boosted clients' traffic, probably, um, as measured by any number of metrics. And they didn't include that feature um, because they prioritized a different goal. And that goal was sort of communicating deference to journalistic judgment, earning journalists' trust, really communicating to them, you know, we're not going to take away your job and, and it's okay to look at our data. You know, we're not like our competitors that don't know the, the sort of limited role of analytics. Um, another way that Chartbeat serves an emotional function in newsrooms, uh, and this was designed into the dashboard, um, is to facilitate optimism, to facilitate moments for celebration and, and boost morale. Um, and so one way that they did this was via what is called the broken dial. So um, essentially, this is a, just a blow up of a concurrence dial. It looks like a kind of like a speedometer and then the number of concurrences on top. And each client has a cap of concurrence um, that they've paid for that they can you know, see on their dashboard. When they break that cap, in other words, when, when they exceed the cap, when the number of people on their site at that time goes past the preset cap, essentially, one employee explained, the dial looks incorrect. Um, and when that happens, the product is broken, but in a fun way. If you didn't have that sort of excitement, it wouldn't work. Um, the product wouldn't work. And so um, the broken dial is really interesting. It's become kind of part of uh, Chartbeat's marketing strategy. It's a part of the appeal of that product, is the excitement of making the product break. Um, you can see an example of this in this go for broke promotional t-shirt, um, the allure of this, right? And so in the moment that the dial breaks, Chartbeat's not really, the aim there isn't to convey this dispassionate, accurate, like rational data, but rather to kind of produce this feeling of excitement, this thrill in clients um, that's sort of intoxicating. And clients' reactions to the dashboard indicated that it was having that effect. So uh, there was a training call I set it on where uh, the client who was, who was being trained or having a call with her Chartbeat uh, employee, uh, she said, we thought about going to a rival analytics service, but then we came crawling back to Chartbeat after a few days. And this employee who was doing the training said, uh, what is it do you think that was the most compelling aspect of Chartbeat? And this was her answer. She said, first of all, if you're into traffic, as most sites are, seeing that number, and she recited the number of concurrence on her site, these aren't the real numbers, but it'll give you a sense, um, 750, that's a really good number. And we're capped at 2,000 concurrent users. So if we're at 1999, in other words, if we're at our cap, we always imagine that we're at 2450 or 5150, but we probably just can't see it because we're capped. So we always have that illusion, like that optimism going on. So we've seen that you know, far from being straightforwardly or solely a tool of rationalization in the newsroom, the Chartbeat dashboard is actually designed to have an emotional resonance for journalists. This is a key part of its appeal. Um, and it does this by assuaging their fears about being rendered obsolete by tools 
uh, like an analytics dashboard, and by boosting their morale. Um, and I've shown that sometimes these social and emotional goals can even take precedence over the rational goal, which is kind of uh, capturing traffic, communicating it um, in a very straightforward fashion. Um, and so I think that's just a really important thing when we talk about analytics. Um, we need to take into account the emotional power of these tools and how sometimes that emotional mission is built into the tool itself. So now we've talked a little bit about how metrics are produced um, and marketed, and, and now I want to talk about how they're used in news organizations. So um, one of the kind of big umbrella findings that I had was that uh, the impact of an analytics tool depends hugely on the organization that's using it. And this seems kind of intuitive, right? Like, how could it not? But that gets lost a lot when we talk about metrics. Um, we have a tendency to say things like, you know, page views incentivize the creation of clickbait, or the dashboard makes people more competitive, or whatever it is. Um, and what I found is that organizational context is just hugely, hugely important. Um, the same tool in two different organizations has very, very different effects. Um, and it's important to understand that if we're going to understand the larger question, which is how is all this data affecting the news? Um, so I looked at two news organizations, as I said, Gawker and the New York Times. And at Gawker, uh, metrics were what I have come to call the three Ps. So they were prominent, they were powerful, and they were public. Um, they were prominent in the sense that Gawker pioneered uh, what is called the big board. So this is a very, it's a very dark photo, but that's because Gawker's office is very dimly lit, quiet place. And um, right when you walk in on the fourth floor where all the editorial staff sit, the first thing you see is the big board, and it displays a ranked list um, by concurrent visitors, it's, it's uh, made, made by Chartbeat, um, showing uh, posts across all eight of the Gawker core sites and how, who is getting the most audience in real time. So this is always shifting. And it's right there when you walk in. You know, if you're a writer, editor at Gawker and you get up to go to the bathroom or to get a snack, you're often going to walk right by it. Um, so it's a very, very prominent presence in the newsroom. Um, the next thing about metrics at Gawker is that they're powerful. So, Gawker has, um, or had until recently, I'll discuss that in a few minutes, Gawker had a traffic-based bonus system. And this meant that each site is given uh, a monthly growth target in Uniques. And if they exceed that target um, for that month, they basically, the site gets a bonus, which is given to the editor to dispense as he or she sees fit. Um, so this used to be a bonus based on page views, now it's a bonus based on uniques. But the point is that editors and writers could earn a lot of extra money um, if they made high traffic numbers. So that's the way that metrics were really powerful at Gawker. And then finally, metrics uh, at Gawker were public, are public. So uh, this is a leaderboard showing the top, showing basically a ranking by unique visitors over the last month. Um, for every writer and editor at Gawker, and, in, and also people who uh, are not paid by Gawker but contribute on its platform, Kinja, um, ranking them. And this is just available online. Anyone can Google it and find it. Um, and, and it's just some of the traffic that they make available. But this stuff is all totally public. Um, so I was seeing this organization where metrics were so powerful, so prominent, so public, and I wanted to know, you know how does that affect the employees who work there um, and the content that they produce? Um, well, for one thing, and this is not surprising perhaps, it's very stressful <laughs> for employees. So this is one writer who said, I'm actually concerned by the extent to which my emotional well-being is dictated by the number of hits on my post. I talked to my therapist about it. Um, and that was actually not uncommon. Several people mentioned like their therapist's opinion on their relationship with traffic and working through that in therapy. So that was not like an unheard of thing. Um, it's really, really stressful. Um, so another effect of this was that Metrics kind of altered the shape of competition um, between editorial staffers at Gawker. Um, so in other words, it kind of had the effect of fueling internal competition rather than external competition, right? Um, so in other words, you know, Gawker staffers were constantly bombarded with data about how they were stacking up against people in the Gawker network um, or how their site was stacking up against other sites in the Gawker network. And they didn't really have, oftentimes, access to that kind of granular data about sites that actually covered the things that they covered from rival companies. Um, and so here's how this works. Like, if you see you know, a leaderboard like this, um, even if, and the people on this leaderboard, they write for all different sites across Gawker. Some of them are editors, some of them are writers, some of them cover celebrities, some of them cover, you know, automobiles. Like, what, they, they, they do all different things. They seem on the face of it kind of qualitatively different in terms of their expertise and their focus. But by ranking them, um, 
the company is sort of saying, these people are comparable. Um, it's taking qualitatively different things, or in this case, people, and rendering them into something that is quantitatively different and measurably different. Um, and so writers really started to adopt that mindset. Um, they really started to compare themselves to people even who might write about something completely different than they did. Um, so this also happened at the site level. This was a staffer from Kotaku, which is Gawker's gaming site. I don't even, I don't even know what other gaming sites are doing traffic-wise. I don't care because I know that this sports site, Deadspin, this politics and celebrity gossip site, Gawker, and this tech site, Gizmodo, that are part of my company, I know how well they're doing. I see how much they're growing every month. And if these sites are about all these other topics can grow to the extent that they're growing, then why can't my site? Um, and so, so what this shows us is you know, that metrics basically can make things comparable that we might not intuitively think are comparable, and that's really powerful for people. Um, and this is an example of how metrics don't just measure existing realities, um, they can actually shape our thinking. They shape the way we see the world. In some sense, they create the thing that they're trying to measure. Um, and so, so there's a sort of enormous pressure to perform well on metrics that writers at, at Gawker feel. Um, and they also feel a lot of uncertainty about metrics, about what's going to do well, right? So there are some topics that seem surefire hits, like anything about the Kardashians. But besides that very pretty small list of stuff that's a surefire hit, there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty about what you know, Facebook is going to reward with traffic that day or whatever. And so writers and editors developed several strategies for coping with that uncertainty. Um, one of the strategies that they developed was that they just posted a lot. They posted really frequently. Um, so one writer explained, it's more or less like playing the lottery. You pick your numbers and you're diligent about it, and the more lottery tickets you buy, the more likely you are to hit it big. Um, so in other words, kind of hoping that you get that viral hit, not a safe strategy, but if you kind of like uh, post a lot, then you have a better chance of something taking off. And what this meant was that a lot of staffers complained that they did not have the time to work on sort of longer, slower, reported out features that many of them were interested in doing because they were always, always trying to post and keep the post count up as a way of keeping their uniques count up. Um, another way that uh, writers and editors managed uncertainty was to go with what works. So this was from one editor who was just totally astonished, and this is an example of unpredictability. Someone, one of her staff had written a little blip of a post about a TV show that was about to have its series finale, and this post had gone like gangbusters in, in uniques and traffic. And so when the series finale of the show aired, this editor said, she said to the writer, I said, I, don't, I need you to cover this first thing in the morning. I don't care what you write, but you need to cover it. Um, so one could come away from all this, and I did come away from all this, with the sense that editorial employees at Gawker work under a really intense system of metrics-driven surveillance and management. Um, and one might ask, and I did ask, you know, why do they stay there, right? Um, many of them had had job offers from, from many other companies. Some of them had even uh, gone to other companies and then come back to Gawker. That, that has, even has a name, it's called the Gawker Boomerang because so many staffers come back. Um, and so I was really interested when I was talking to folks there, like, why, this is, you're so stressed out, like, why are you staying here? What's the draw? Um, and I always got the same answer, which was that people would say, I really love the editorial autonomy I have here. Um, I feel like I'm really free. Um, so here is an editor, she says, Nick Denton uh, lets us do whatever we want. We can write whatever we want, we can take the site wherever we need to go. And what this really means, what she's really saying, um, is that she and other editorial staffers who chose to be at Gawker and to stay there or to return there were effectively choosing metrics-driven oversight um, over more traditional forms of editorial oversight, right? So as stressed out as they were by traffic pressures, and they really were, um, they accepted them much more than they would have an editor who told them, you know, you can't use that tone, or you can't use the F word, or you can't, you know, like, uh, and really just kind of police them in that way. Um, and so what we may be seeing, and I want to discuss this possibly in Q&A if people are interested in, is kind of a new way of defining editorial freedom and what that means. Um, and what editorial constraint is also. There, maybe there's a new way of defining that for folks who are working in certain corners of digital media. Um, so writers are not free at a place like Gawker from worrying about commercial considerations, right? They're constantly bombarded with data that's reminding them of commercial considerations in the form of metrics. Um, but they are fairly free from worrying about an editor not liking their tone or their style um, or what they choose to post on. And so to them, uh, you know, the, the metrics-driven freedom 
that they felt was, was preferable, and I think that's really, really a fascinating thing uh, to explore. So I'll move on now to the times. So at, the, at, at Gawker, we talked about how metrics are prominent, public, powerful. At the times, uh, the use of metrics was very restricted. Um, it was much more rare, and it was discretionary. Um, so this is uh, two quotes from reporters. Essentially, the Times had a system in place of sort of tiered access to metrics. So reporters uh, didn't have much access to this data, and editors had much more access to it. Um, but even editors, they had a lot of discretion in terms of how they were going to look at data, what they were going to do with it. Um, you know, it was really left up to them, and uh, and it was it was not uh, very often used to, to kind of make editorial decisions. Um, rather, what I found was essentially that editors used metrics to kind of back up or corroborate decisions that they had already made. Um, so here's an editor kind of summing this up. If I need to prove a point, I go there. If I need to prove a point, I, I look at metrics. Um, and some really interesting examples of how this works came up in my interviews. So there was a, one story about how um, an editor went to someone in the newsroom who, who looked a lot at data and was very well versed in it and, um, and said, you know, can you pull some data for me on traffic to the Bats blog? This was the erstwhile Times baseball blog. Um, can you pull it by 5 p.m. Um, today? And this person said, yeah, I can get that for you. Like, what, what do you need it for? And it turned out that this editor was assigning three reporters to cover this baseball game that was happening later that night. And two of them were going to write for the print paper and have their stories in the print paper, which at the time, uh, you know, and still to some extent, was the kind of locus of prestige at the Times as an organization. And then the third reporter was going to be writing for the blog. And this third reporter was like not so happy about this assignment. Uh, so, so the editor that, that had assigned this staffing in this way uh, wanted some traffic data about the blog so he could bring it to this reporter and say, hey, look, you're going to get such a big audience writing for the blog. The blog is a great place to have your work, um, and you should feel psyched about it. Um, and so, so that's an example of sort of you know, this editor not using data to kind of make any kind of editorial decision, but rather to bolster or lend support to a decision that he had already made about staffing. Um, so as you can imagine, some of the reporters I talked to at the Times were really curious about data. They wanted to know what kind of traffic their stories were getting. Um, and what developed at the Times was a bit of like a black market for data, where reporters, sometimes with the help of uh, web producers, would kind of spread data amongst themselves when they could, um, at least those who were curious about it. So here's one reporter. Um, I don't have a chart account, but I do like to look over the shoulder of the guy that sits in front of me who does, because he's a web producer, so he has access to it and sees it. Um, so we see that even at a place like the Times that's trying, that was trying to de-emphasize metrics, this data had a really powerful pull on writers. And it was so powerful that it could be used as a management technique by editors. Um, you know, it wouldn't have worked if they didn't care. Um, so to conclude, as different as you know, Gawker and the Times have been in terms of how they deal with this kind of data, there's evidence that they might be moving ever closer together. So, um, the Times published about a year ago the Innovation Report, um, which was about the, the organization's transition to, to the digital space. Um, and one of the major recommendations of the team that produced this report was to kind of roll out metrics more broadly in the newsroom, get more staffers, including reporters, much more comfortable with data. Um, and there's now folks in place that are, that are kind of trying to make that happen. And Samantha, one of our panelists, is, is uh, helping with that effort. So hopefully she can tell us a little bit more about it. Um, so that's kind of what the Times is up to. And then at Gawker, um, Gawker, at the very beginning of this year in January, they ditched their uh, traffic-based bonus system. And they replaced it with a system by which there's a very small group of senior editorial staffers who basically pour through about 400 posts from the previous month. And they have this big argument with each other about which ones they think merit a bonus. Um, and that's how they're determining bonuses. So um, they still have the big board. They still have a lot of this data. But it's not as powerful as it, as it used to be um, as of just a couple months ago. So, um, so we see these sort of two organizations that were on really different plays in the spectrum starting to move closer to each other. The Times trying to you know, integrate metrics a little bit more. Gawker trying to de-emphasize metrics a little bit more. Um, and so I, you know, I think that that's a really interesting moment, and we can talk about that too, uh, in the sense that you know, so far there haven't really been any cohesive norms or professional standards about how this kind of data should be used um, in, in news organizations. But maybe we're starting to see 
some more coalescence about this, like what's fair game to use and what's not and, and how should it be distributed and who should have access and that kind of thing. Um, yeah, so, so those are some of the key findings and uh, one of the recommendations that I wrote in the report was that I wanted, I hoped that there would be kind of spaces to discuss this stuff that were removed from daily production pressures where reporters or editors are on deadline and they don't have time to really think, you know, big picture strategically. So I hope none of us are on an imminent deadline um, and we can kind of take this opportunity to be one of those spaces and to have that broader conversation. Um, so let's get to it. Thank you. So um, now I'd like to invite up my esteemed panelists. Uh, let me grab my pen. Okay. All right. So mm -hmm. thanks to you guys for being here. Um, I'm just going to introduce the panelists, and um, and then I'll pose some questions to them, and then we, you can pose questions to all of us. Um, so all the way on the right, we have Samantha Hennig figuring out microphone issues. Got it. Good? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Um, so Sam is the deputy features editor at the New York Times. Um, she's working with the styles, real estate, home, and travel sections on their digital Oops. presence. No more home. Oh, OK. Uh, OK. <laughs> styles, real estate, and travel. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Home and clothes. We can um, talk about that. <laughs> Uh, before that, she was the digital editor at the New York Times Magazine, where she oversaw the magazine's web production as well as videos, interactive graphics, and multimedia products, um, projects tied to the magazine content. She co-wrote a book with her mother, Robin Marantz Hennig, who's here. <laughs> um, it's called 20-something, Why Do Young Adults See Stuck? Samantha previously worked at The New Yorker as the digital news editor and at Newsweek, both in print and online, where she helped launch Double X, a women's web magazine that was part of the Sleeve Group. Um, then, next to Sam, we have Chad Matlin, senior editor at 538. Previously, he was an editor for Reuters Opinion, Reuters online commentary arm. And before that, he was a freelance journalist in Brooklyn, writing mainly about technology, business, politics, um, and the intersections thereof. He has written for Fortune.com, New York Magazine, The All, uh, New Republic, BuzzFeed, Columbia Journalism Review, Bloomberg Business Week. Um, and from 2008 to 2010, he was the associate editor of um, Slate's big business site. And then finally, we have John Herman. He's the co-editor of The All. Um, did I pronouncing that right? OK, good. <laughs> uh, previously, he worked happily under the analytics regimes of both Gawker Media and BuzzFeed. So that will be interesting. Um, yeah, so thank you guys so much for being here um, and talking about this with me. So I've got, I'm going to start with a question for each of you, and then I'll open up to like ones I have for all three of you. So um, Sam, I want to start with you. Uh, so you are, have been appointed as one of the digital deputies um, that is tasked with, among other things, kind of helping to roll out metrics slightly more broadly in the newsroom or in the sections that you're working with. Can you just tell us a little bit about like what that consists of? What's the impetus there? What are you guys thinking about? Sure. Um, so after the innovation report came out, I think there was a lot that was discussed in there and uh, the newsroom leadership wanted to act fast on something and the thing that they chose was audience development, which was one of the topics. And so um, they appointed this woman, Alex McCollum, to lead an audience development group in the newsroom. She had been on the product side, and that was kind of a big deal to bring someone from the product side over into the newsroom, because product is like more business oriented. Um, and so she has been building up this team of, we were just making fun of, one of the titles is growth editors, which I think sounds disgusting, but <laughs> you've got their growth editors, they're like SEO specialists, they're social media specialists, um, and they're analytics specialists. And so some of the data people in that group actually come from a, a, a like real analytics background. Like yeah. one guy who I work with a lot used to work at a hedge fund. I don't know why you would go from a hedge fund to the New York Times. <laughs> But, uh, but he did. Um, and so I think that the idea is that they've got this team of specialists and then those people can't really, you know, it's a big newsroom, they can't, they can't be involved in the day-to-day -day kind of decisions and um, the way that this information will get used. Um, and so that's why they've put these digital deputies in place at, at the desk level to 
kind of be the liaison to be able to speak the language of the audience development people and then make it sound a little less daunting to uh, the people at the desk level. Yeah, so how do you do that? Um, how do I do it? Well, <laughs> I mean, it helps to know your audience. I think that there's a pretty big range in terms of New York Times people of how um, eager they are to embrace this stuff. I mean, I think, as I'm sure you've noticed, like a lot of people are hungry for data. Yeah. They just don't know how to get it or they don't have the logins or whatever. So yeah. with those people, it's just a matter of sort of helping them get access, but also um, trying to focus them in on what is um, going to be productive. I mean, I think that it's a kind of strange moment right now because uh, so many people know that they are supposed to care about data and they know certain words around data, but, but then it's still a little messy how to actually ask questions that data can answer and then get the data that answers those questions. Yeah. And so I feel like that's a big part of my role is, is helping direct that in a more sort of productive way. I mean, a lot of people talk about running experiments that don't resemble anything like a true experiment. So um, I think it, that's part of where people get uh, nervous about how to roll this stuff out is that I think we want to do it in a way where um, we really are getting useful information at the end of it. So is the worry that like people will see it who don't really know how to interpret it or what to do based on it and kind of make the wrong assumptions or something like that? Yeah, I think that there is a lot of that. I mean, I think that the the, the quote that you had about like going to the data when you want to make a point yeah. is very, uh, that rings very true. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so coming at it, I mean, this is what's, useful about now having people who have more of a like true data background involved in the process is that you know they'll come into a room an editor might say I want to know you know X and then they'll say well actually I, I don't think that's quite what you want to know or, or you're you know they kind of help steer them and we have someone here James who is a Times data guru and um, he, I remember James gave a very good example of how um, people are sometimes asking the wrong questions at the time, which was, um, I don't know if you guys remember Snowfall, it was kind of a big deal. Uh, it was like a digital uh, multimedia extravaganza, and after Snowfall, the next big digital multimedia extravaganza was about a jockey, a horse racing jockey, and James said that he met with the sports desk before that came out and was and they were talking about you know how can we measure whether this reaches the audience that we want it to reach and James said well who it, who's the audience for this yeah. and they said uh, people who like snowfall and he said well do you think maybe it's people who like horse racing like do you think that we want to look at whether people who have read our horse racing coverage also will read this story or is it really just that people who read long multimedia <laughs> stories read other long multimedia stories. So it's questions like that and, and having having the right people in the room who know how to focus focus editors in on productive questions and productive sort of tests to answer those questions. Yeah, thanks. That's that's a great overview. Really helpful. Um, you're welcome. So Chad, uh, so we so you're at 538, which is famously a very data literate organization with many data literate journalists working there. Um, but you have said that, that so far, um, the use of metrics is not so much at this point. Is that? Yeah, I mean, the great, one of the great ironies is like we were too busy creating a website about analytics to use many of the analytics on the website that we were creating. Um, <laughs> we have Chartbeat. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a couple other programs that will tell us page views and whatever else. Um, for us, you know, so Nate Silver, the, the creator of 538, uh, came over from the Times to ESPN uh, a, year, a year and a half ago or so. So that's about a year and a half old. And we were just so, um, we were searching for what the site's tone and approach would be to so many different issues. But the idea of measuring success based on analytics alone felt alien to us because we wanted to measure on the quality of the, of the work first. Um, and so as a result, we sort of, uh, didn't have a product person in place um, either, and so we were very focused on the editorial 
perhaps to the detriment of the site, you know, in, in, in the first 18 months or so, but are now beginning to start that process. And so as you're beginning to start that process, um, you mentioned that you guys are hiring an audience development person. What are some of the things that you're thinking through? Like, do you have some of the same worries that, that Sam talked about, about people maybe misinterpreting this stuff, or is that not as much a concern at a place like 538? Like, what are the big questions that you guys are wrestling with as you try to form a policy around this? Yeah, I mean, for our, so we have reporters who use numbers, or, or who are sort of can use Excel in a way that you have never seen Excel be used before. And so they, you can't keep them from the metrics on their own stuff. That's not really an issue for us um, necessarily. I think when we think about you know, audience development, it's, it's sort of about how to bring, up, how to bring a site up to um, industry standards that hadn't really even been thinking about this stuff before because we were sort of so focused on what was right in front of us. Um, and so there's, for new sites that are just starting up, I think there's a, there are a couple different ways you can do it. If you're if you're a purely traffic play, then you just go for the the, met, the quantified metrics, and that's how you judge your success. But in our case, we have this institutional backing from ESPN, which l allows us to maybe not concentrate on that because we don't have to worry about you know making a certain um, uh, cost per thousand impressions in a certain month or something like that because ESPN is both a portal and also a, a, a benevolent uh, corporate benefactor. <laughs> Um, so John, uh, back in your BuzzFeed days, uh, you called Chartbeat, quote, the addictive sanity ruining stats tool. Um, so, which kind of like jives with some of the things that I heard, especially at, at Gawker. Um, <clears throat> but now you run a website. Um, how do you kind of, what is your relationship to metrics there and how do you, how do you guys deal with this stuff uh, at the all? Uh, that was one of one of the first things I wrote for for BuzzFeed. It was it must have been some sort of like premature lashing out, um, but it I, I think generally like what uh, what I found there talking to people turned out to be mostly true. Uh, one of the people I spoke to for that piece I now work with, uh, Adam Frucci, who runs Splitsider, and he was talking about how he's always trying to. Uh, he, he would try to limit his own use of the of the site. Like he stopped dedicating a whole second monitor to it, but he would still check it a few times a day. We ran a, a an experiment uh, lately, or uh, recently. <laughs> was it really? Yeah, it was a it was a, <laughs> a carefully structured experiment where someone in our office took changed the Charpeat password and didn't tell everyone what it was, <laughs> and um, would tell anyone who asked. And it was sort of interesting to see who did ask and who didn't ask. Uh, Matt, Matt Buchanan, my co-editor, has not asked for the password. I did, quickly. Um, and I think this really hasn't worked out well for me because I bear most of the emotional uh, weight of our chart beat up and down and, and mostly just sort of in the middle. Um, so we, we use analytics, but the, we don't even subscribe to the uh, higher tier of chart beat. So we use like the whatever it is, $50 a month cheap version. And all that, I mean, that's another form of self-sabotage because all that really does is give you an immediate sense of where you are on that, on that dial. Um, and it's mostly downside because you can't really do anything with the positive information. If something's already succeeding, you can promote it some more and probably expect to get more out of each promotional effort. If it's failing, you might do the exact same thing. Just promote it more and just get less out of it. It's sort of, there isn't a very strong relationship for us between the data we get from Chartbeat and Google Analytics uh, and what we do. Likewise, there isn't a strong relationship between traffic as recorded by either system and, as I understand it, through our, our business person, the revenue we get. Like there is obviously, obviously more is more and a greater number of readers is better, but it's just there, there are too many disconnects for us to really think of Chartbeat as something that can guide us, but we still look at it all the time, so that's how we use it. Because it's... It's like, it's like you, if you write online, there, you can sort of get the feeling sometimes that no one's reading or that you might not even exist, and you need to be reminded like, a lot. 
Um, can, can I jump in there? I mean, you're in a really loud room. Is is the one of the ways to think that? Like, you're yeah. talking in a room with a lot of other people talking, and sometimes you don't know if anyone's actually hearing you to that effect because right. so many other people are writing um, online. And I, I, I think for me, when I think about Charpy's emotional effect, it's the same. It, it's a, it's not just Charpy for journalists anymore because there are metrics now when I tweet, right? I'm finding out how many faves or retweets I get. And I'm con the feedback mechanism isn't just isolated to my professional work. It could be uh, that I'm, I'm getting feedback from my quasi-professional activities online, too. And so you're constantly being told whether or not something's successful, whether mm -hmm. it's not within Trophy. Yeah, well, that ties into the kind of broader way in which metrics have infiltrated an increasing number of facets of our daily lives, like not even just Twitter, but how many steps you're taking and how, what is the quality of your sleep and all this stuff. I mean, do you think that, like, do you see, you know, journalists that are coming up now who are kind of like younger and have had this stuff forever, are they much more comfortable and conversant with this kind of data? And the idea that using this data as a measure of their performance and the quality of what they're doing? I think a lot of the data that you get from social networks is really, uh, motivated data in, in that it's designed to encourage you to use the service more. So I think people, someone who's fluent on social media sort of intuits that that data is not useful for anything, but that it's nice or fun. But I, I don't think it, I don't know, there, there, I, there has to be some level of distrust there. Um, but we, we bring in young writers all the time. That's sort of one of, our, one of our goals is to bring in new people who haven't really had a platform before. And it's been a while. Um, I, we don't get too many requests for traffic. People will wonder if their pieces are doing well, yeah. but they can sort of tell from Twitter or from Facebook. You can see those things are all, if you look hard enough, public for anything posted on the internet. You can see how many Facebook shares any link has gotten. Um, I think the young people are definitely more comfortable with data, but whether they're more conversant in it, like truly uh, accurately conversant, I'm skeptical of. Um, and I mean, maybe this is partially that my father is a social scientist who's also here. I'm just going to keep making shout outs to the audience. <laughs> but, uh, you know, people will say, oh, we posted this on Facebook at 8 p.m. and it got, and it blew up. It got way more likes than our things normally get. And it's like, okay, well, does that mean that posting at 8 p.m. is what did it? Or is it what the story was or what the headline was? Or, you know, yeah. was it just the particular mix of things that were posted that night? So I think that there are a lot of people coming in to media and probably all fields who are used to having access to these numbers but aren't actually necessarily trained in how to interpret all of these numbers in a productive way. It's, it's funny. Yeah. So when I have a freelance writer, I'll sometimes use traffic and page views as like a as a way to get them to write for me again, in a way, because I'll, I'll give them their page view number, but I won't tell them why it is that their page view number is high, let's say, which is that maybe it went on the ESPN.com homepage, right. which is like a massive portal that you couldn't do at a, at a site our size otherwise. Yeah. I just give them the number. I sort of strip the context <laughs> from them as a way to sort of get them to think, oh, writing for 538 is really good for my career or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so you're part of the problem. Yeah. <laughs> but it's to my advantage, right? Like, right. I, if they ask me, if, more, if I happily tell them it was on ESPN.com right. for 24 hours or whatever, but, you know, picking and choosing how I use data and deploy it, yeah. I'm, I'm very complicit well, you, in that. I'm curious, because we have a similar thing where it's like, if something goes on the New York Times homepage, it, it explodes in terms of mm -hmm. traffic just for being on the homepage. And uh, it's surprising the degree to which you can't actually run experiments with, even though we're part of the same company. It's not like we can say to the homepage editors, hey, we want to like, you know, put this on the homepage at this time and see what that does compared to if we do it this other way or like we're, we don't run A-B tests on the homepage or anything. It doesn't feel like we're all like part of this team using the mm. homepage power in order to test things because Obviously, they're making decisions about the homepage based on like news uh, value. But do you feel like at ESPN, like if you said, are there people who you can say, we want to see what happens if this goes on the ESPN? We homepage? control our box, our, okay. our things. It's a little different. Okay, so you can really test. Yeah. And do we like I changed a picture on a piece about Deflategate, the Patriots uh, football thing today, and 
the chart bead needle for or the chart bead little blue line for it stopped its great decline. It slightly leveled out. And I was like, oh, the picture might have helped. And then, I don't know, like, I, that's a little piece of trivia. I'm not sure it means that I'm going to, like, try and change more pictures going forward. But it is a little piece of leverage to game out or something yeah. um, if I wanted to. Leverage, what do you mean? It's like a, it's an extra, um, it's an extra button to push. You know, it's an extra thing to try and manipulate to see mm -hmm. if I can get more readers or something. But then the question becomes, does it, is the end game getting more readers or is the end game, because that's something that ha that's happening after the, the thing has been published. Right, right. Um, but it's, I'm not making edit, edit decisions necessarily based on that, aside mm -hmm. from sculpting the, the sort of scope of the piece. Yeah. Well, it's interesting to think about, I mean, because I was really surprised in, in my research on both Gawker and The Times, like the way in which metrics operate as a management, as an interpersonal tool um, to motivate people or to you know, assess their performance or whatever, and, and that they have this kind of immediate and very intense power in that way. Um, but it seems like there's maybe more uncertainty I'm hearing from you guys about editorially, like what to do with that. Like managerially, it's very clear <laughs> how to use them if you want to use them in that way. But editorially, maybe it's a little bit more difficult Difficult. Is that fair to say? If I were representing our numbers to a bunch of employees, um, it's immediately obvious how I would misrepresent them. Like it's mm -hmm. that's those those options are so clear that you would, depending on what you want from a particular employee, you would you would tell them when things are succeeding or when things haven't performed as as planned. It, it gives power to whoever has the metrics. It's weird to be both the audience for the metrics and the, anyway. Um, one thing that, one situation that I've come across a few times recently that is, is kind of a weird integration of analytics into this whole relationship is any company that has a platform, um, but that is also a publisher. So something like Buzzfeed where people can sign up for accounts and post, or something like Medium where uh, someone can sign up and post anything or write for one of the paid magazines within the company. I did a freelance thing for Matter, one of the media magazines, and so we had the editor-writer relationship, there was the payment, and then after publication, there was an analytics dashboard that I didn't know I had access to, mm -hmm. which was odd. And I didn't know, I felt like I was seeing something I wasn't supposed to see. Hmm. Um, there was nothing for me to do with it. It was just sort of like, a ruling on my on my piece after after it was posted, um, and again, that's a situation where the analytics were very powerful for me and completely without utility. Like I, that's just something I know. Yeah, yeah. I think that to the to the issue of like how to use analytics editorially and whether it is an editorial decision to change the photo on the Yes Man homepage. I mean, I do think that that's. Uh, like that's what makes people so uncomfortable at the times at least it, in terms of where they're scared that things could go is in the direction and you reference this like they're, they're scared that it could become well we see that kim kardashian stories do a lot better so i guess we should have someone on the kim kardashian beat and that they're they'd be making editorial decisions based on that and i i feel like where we are right now there's so much room to use data to inform decisions without getting anywhere near that thorny stuff. And it's and it is things like presentation, like, you know, if we like right now we don't really have an ability to A B test headlines, which is something that I believe that like Huffington Post that's just standard, that they can put two headlines in, there's two fields and they can see which one performs better. You know, a, a segment of the audience sees each one and then they can make a choice. And so things like that, and, and then also just the timing of publication, which is um, especially like relevant to the sections I work on, the features sections, and to big enterprise, uh, like the nail salon thing that we had today. That's something that has been in the works for, I think, more than a year. So what time did that go up? It went up, it was supposed to go up at 6 a.m. And then I think because of the Korean translation, it got slightly held. And was that subject to like long discussions about like when to pull the trigger? Um, well, it was, I mean, it was in 
in the older era of like a month ago, it probably would have gone up on like a Friday night or a Saturday morning because often the biggest, like newsiest enterprise stories were saved for the Sunday paper. And so if it's going in the Sunday paper, then it goes online, you know, fri Friday or Saturday. And usually if there's a lot of pieces like a Korean translation, it, even if the plan is to publish Friday morning, it ends up getting pushed back. And so then it goes into this like dead zone of Friday evening traffic. So that's the kind of thing where it's, you know, it's very obvious to us that we should be publishing things at the times when our readers are coming to us. We're able to see when our readers are coming to us and on what devices. And so there's all of these decisions that we can be making about how to like optimize according to that without getting into any ethical quandaries. And when will it run in the paper now? Tomorrow or Sunday? I think it ran today, oh, right? OK. Uh, Proves that I didn't read my print, my print edition of the Times today. <laughs> Oh, so it's, it really is running on Sunday? Well, that's May an even bigger deal. So it, it said May 10th on the I read it. Okay. Well, Jay, Jay King's uh, activism story was also a May 10th that ran was like that a yesterday. Was story? Yeah, it's a magazine story. Yeah, so the magazine, which is where I used to work, this was a huge uh, question all the time, is everything yeah. is Sunday, but we have it all. The magazine closes nine days before it comes out in print, so we have a nine-day window when all of those stories are ready and we can put them online whenever we want. So then it, it, it does become interesting to use metrics to sort of game that. But then there's also, um, I mean, to, with that particular question, another thing that, that people speculate about is like, well, if you put it online too early, then when it runs in print, or print readers pissed off that they've already read this story? And that's, uh, there actually was a, uh, an experiment, a true experiment that was done uh, at the Times by the Consumer Insight Group that that looked at that question. But it was it was not a like it was a qualitative experiment. It was that they talked to people and said, "How do you feel when you?" Stop. Yeah, and and the answer was actually no. The people either didn't care or they liked it because they that way they saw it, they got excited about it, and they read it in print. But anyway, there, there's. Uh, I feel like that's a case where like it's really hard to answer that question with numbers because you can try different things, but every story is going to be different. But so then there are these other ways that you can answer the question, like a uh, reader survey. Yeah. Well, so I want to touch a little bit more on this. You mentioned like the word ethics and ethical, which I think is interesting. Um, one thing that I often hear when I interview journalists is uh, is this word balance. So you can't totally ignore this stuff because that would just I mean you would just you just can't uh, in, in 2015. But there was also like some trepidation, more or less depending on the outlet that this person works for, but about you know using it to make certain kinds of decisions versus others. Like, what, But it was often hard for people to articulate what that balance actually looks like in practice. So are there rules that you guys have established for yourselves about you know this would be over the line of something that would just not be okay journalistically to do with data, um, whereas like this other thing, maybe choosing what time to put something up is is totally fine. Um, like, are there organizational ways of thinking about that? Are there individual ways of thinking about that? Um, how are the, how is the ethical question being hashed out? So it seems to me like there's a difference between production and edit for, 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 for a probably overly facile dichotomy. But like the picture and even the headline, uh, I don't know. But like, okay, so definitely the picture, definitely the packaging, definitely if a chart is the lead of a, of, of a post as opposed to in the third graph of the, you know, sort of leads into it or something, that's a production thing to me. The edit is, are we going to bring a, um, are we going to bring a human voice at the top? Because we've seen that our human voices, our pieces with human voices at the top do 10% better. That's a totally theoretical thing. But that to me is something that I'm supposed to be making journalism that people want to read. And if someone wants to read or they're more engaged or they read deeper in the piece because we bring the human, especially in our case because there's so many numbers, the human voice is in first, then that's something I'm, I'm willing to engage with. That doesn't feel icky to me. Um, so the question of like, should we send a reporter to the Iowa caucus? Do our readers care enough? We've been covering the UK election, and it has not done the traffic that a US election would do. 
but for various reasons, it was important for us to do it. And I think um, after it's over, we'll have a conversation about it editorially and traffic-wise. And then I guess this is back to the balance thing. You know, you have to you have to make the choice. It's a limited resource sort of situation. Yeah. So there's maybe some distinction between like form and content or something like that. Yeah, I think metrics inform both. So we're, we, we've been playing a 538 with, with an idea of, um, of uh, what's called an ABCD EF, EFG test. It like goes into infinity and you can offer 20 different versions of the story. And for, through various statistical modeling, you can see which of the things are actually, it's called multivariate test, testing, which of the things are actually affecting engagement with the piece. Um, and so like if we were to find out that putting a chart at the top is better than not, then do we actually act on that is a question we'll have to confront. And then on top of that, if we're, we're probably going to do an experiment where we run an unedited version of the story. Mm -hmm. And if that does better than the edited version of the story, then how are we going to confront right. that, right? Even though we think that the journalism might be better or something. I doubt we would go with the unedited, but whatever. Yeah. Once you turn over that rock, you don't know what you're going right. to find underneath it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there are people turning over all these rocks online somewhere. and. Like the form experiments are really interesting from an analytic standpoint, because if you if you work at a place that is truly analytics driven, um, the thing that's most fluid is is form. A, a place like BuzzFeed is extremely savvy with analytics and will therefore put a lot of focus on new uh, post concepts and new post formats and entire new ways to deliver, basically a unit of entertainment or some news. Um, you could characterize that as a slippery slope, um, but I'm not sure what's at the bottom, like a lot of traffic and <laughs> a lot of posts that people really like and, and share online. Uh, but where it gets tricky is when they cover the Syrian uh, rebellion. I feel like at some point they did the Syrian rebellion in almost like a slideshow form or something? Yeah. Well, and then the form overwhelmed the editorial product in a way. Yeah, and that's an, easy, that's an easy trap to fall into, I think, especially with forms that people aren't familiar with. Um, and there, I mean, there are some examples that are really clear from the outside that aren't so clear when you're sort of in the middle of it trying to crack some new form. You're like, well, why don't we do a GIF list um, with all these like pop culture references of this news event where people yeah, are saying. dying? Um, and there, there, like, as, as weird as it sounds, there is somewhere in the middle of that spectrum that is totally fine. Um, you know, the, you, you write to be engaging, and you can take, you can take that effort way, way too far. Um, and analytics do provide a lot of temptation to do that, um, particularly without editorial guidance to interpret them for you. Um, but that's, that's, a loss of perspective thing. That's not some inherent evil of analytics. That's the kind of thing that happens in an institution where you don't have structure built around the analytics. You don't have someone to interpret them for you or someone to turn them into editorial guidance that adheres to something beyond just like a traffic strategy. And there really isn't, I mean, there is no publication that is purely a traffic play that is uh, sustainable. I mean, they're out there, but they're like little. You know, it's like one guy doing viral posts, just like copying viral posts from other sites and getting like 100 million uniques and then disappearing. Um, but the, the, ones with, the ones with funding, the ones that want to be sustainable businesses will overstep a lot, but they're, you can usually find some sort of shape of a soul-like thing in the middle. Um, well, and do you guys feel like traffic play is like two years ago and that things are really moving toward time on page? Because that's yeah. kind of what I think Chartbeat is pushing. That was Chartbeat's big push for a long time. Um, Chartbeat's in a weird, weird position because they both need to provide like useful information to their clients, but they also need to flatter their clients, which your report sort of got at. They, they need to make their clients feel good using their product. And time on page is flattering for a particular type of client, a particular type of content. It helps, uh, if, you, if you have a long, -term, a long, a long form story, uh, do well. Like we had one uh, a while ago, it was about the, the Times style section and its history, and it was a deeply reported, great piece. And it, it did well 
in raw views. We, it, you know, our chart beat did the needle thing. Um, but Chartbeat also has a time on page indicator, and that was really high, and that was reassuring to us in some way that this was this was better for us and in general than the little post the week before that had done just as much raw traffic. Um, but that's, I mean, we it was better because we knew people were spending more time reading the thing that we created. It didn't, in I don't think in any real way, translate to more revenue for what? us. I mean, I think, I don't know where Chartbeat is with this, but I, I remember reading at some point that like they were trying to get more advertisers on board so that um, so that it would translate into money, that you are like, that as, as they're better at tracking how far down the page people are going, that you could sell ads in a different way that's less sort of impression view yeah. based and more actual impression down the page based. That would be excellent, I think for a lot of publishers, but I think right now the pressures for web publishers, the, ki the kinds of ads that we're talking about there are a, like a little, kind of, they're kind of crude, like everything yeah. is, is programmatic, decided by computers, you know, something is either viewed or not after, I don't know, two seconds or something. Um, it would, if there were some sort of ad product that scaled with scroll depth, that would be a great that, that would be very useful, but I'm not sure there are many places that can that can actually connect that to their businesses. Yeah. Well, there there is a couple of folks from Sharpie that are oh. here, <laughs> not to call you guys out, but if you just want to say something quickly about about this issue, jump in. Yeah. Sure. Uh, hi. <laughs> there are three of us, but I'm Josh Wurtz. I run this. Oh, yeah. um, I'm Josh Schwartz. I run the data science team at Chirpy. Um so, so what we've seen is a few kind of early adopters of this where what folks have been doing is moving toward selling ads where they're sort of directly sold on time. So typically with display advertising on the internet, at least on the premium web, there's this notion of, of a cost per mill which is cost per, somebody pays $2 per thousand ads that are shown. And what we've seen is folks like the Financial Times moving towards saying, we'll instead pay you know, $20 per hour that my ads are seen for, whether that's 100 impressions where the person spent a really long time on the page, or 1,000 impressions where the person spent a second or two. So it still is in kind of early stages, but we've seen some, some kind of interesting early adopters doing really, really well uh, with, with that sort of product. That, that seems to be available at like a certain tier, right? Like in the way that, in the way that like direct ad buys are available at a certain tier. Um, but at that point you're negotiating with a human being and you're saying like, well, let's work out a deal. Um, so I mean, maybe that. Isn't that just traffic incentive or metrics incentivizing a different thing? Like it, yeah, it's, it's yeah. incentivizing a thing that maybe high-minded people in this room think is good. Right. But. I don't know, maybe readers don't want to read for a long time. Maybe they want to just well, like, pop in and, and get the news and leave. I also think one of, the, one of the reasons that video embedded on other sites, like people embedding clips from The Daily Show or John Oliver or whatever, it was such a successful strategy for some time was that Facebook calculated time on page as part of their uh, yeah. uh, story ranking. And so, what better way to get someone to spend 10 minutes on your page than to have them watch a 10 minute video clip. Yeah, so that really segues into my next question and then, and then I'll open it up more broadly, um, which, is, which is kind of bringing up the, the elephant in the room of any discussion of digital news right now, which is Facebook. So there's been these announcements recently that Facebook is talking with you know, news publishers about posting directly to Facebook and Facebook hosting their content. Um, rather than having to link out from Facebook, you know, the news feed to uh, a website. And the New York Times is one of the places that's in conversation about this, as is BuzzFeed. Now, John, you've written a lot about this and what it means for news, which I'm, I'm interested to talk about. And also, if you guys think that, you know, metrics are, are part of the, the kind of impetus to, like traffic is part of the impetus, obviously, to, to do this. Um, but what are the implications of Facebook kind of controlling more and more and more of the news space online? Uh, one thing that nobody outside of these uh, conversations is, is seen is the Facebook CMS. And part of that CMS is presumably some sort of analytics platform. People are very familiar with Facebook pages and page reach and things like that. If you're, if you're a a publication or a brand or 
a celebrity you, or you just started a page, you can see how many people are interacting with it approximately. You, you have like a, dash, a, a Facebook version of the dashboards that we saw on the, in the projection, but they're all intended to do different things. They're intended to help you know how many people are, are looking at your stuff, but they're also intended to sell you ads on Facebook. They'll say, we, we can extend your reach for only $20. We can guarantee you, you know, 20,000 more views on your, on your page within this time frame for this amount of money. So presumably the publisher's analytics will be different, but there's always the, the problem that they will be supplied by the company that is also handling your advertising. Right. Um, so you kind of just have to trust that they are correct. I mean, I guess they are de facto right. I mean, they're right <laughs> in the context of Facebook, but they, they are sort of separated from it, you, you lose some control um, over your data and you lose some of that. The, the BuzzFeed line about this is that when you go into a new, work with a new platform, you want to not just get back traffic um, or audience, but you want to get back data. Um, and there is a question about which platforms will give back useful data. Um, and we just, we don't know what Facebook will do. Yeah, do you guys have thoughts on this too? Yeah, uh, I mean, I feel like in some ways, I mean, the Facebook thing is, is very interesting. I'm, I'm just as intrigued by the Snapchat question because that's something where, like, I mean, so there is this question of what is the end goal? Like, when you're doing your multivariate testing, like, what is success? Is it page views? Is it engagement time? In the case of the Times, is it, like, subscribers, which is a kind of different but related metric? And, or is it, like, brand reach? equity, brand equity, you know, something that's like much mushier. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like with Snapchat, there is no way to get traffic from Snapchat right now. Um, and yet they launched this Discover thing. They got a bunch of brands on board to dedicate a, a lot of resources to producing these daily uh, things for Snapchat that only live on Snapchat that are pretty impressive if you watch them and, and I think take like a lot of bodies to do and so why and is that paying off I mean you're yeah. reaching this younger audience who now knows what your brand is but if they're not coming back to your site and they're not giving you any money but according to news reports they're being snapchat ad rates are super high yeah but I thought that no one was really buying them at least at the beginning Maybe, what, I mean that might change they, yeah. they have, they have a, you sell your ads there and that maybe well that's what who just some company just said, we don't care where we are, like where people are reading us. I think related to the Facebook thing. Like we don't care if they read us on our site or if they're reading us somewhere else. We just want to get to people wherever they are. And that's, I guess, one strategy. But it's, uh, it's a different Is it sustainable? Angle. Yeah. Uh, I think the Snapchat deal is you keep different percentages of the advertising depending on whether or not your company sold it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you keep maybe all of it if you sell the ads, and Snapchat will sell them for you, which is probably much easier. Um, but there but does seem to be some sense in which both of these things are like a Faustian bargain, right? Like you kind of, you get more of a, not maybe a younger audience that you'd have trouble reaching, or on you get so much, so many, such a bigger audience on Facebook, but at the same time then, you know, if you migrate more and more of your content to these platforms that your company doesn't control, you know, they, they that assumes that you're like that yeah. you're like syndicating your content on the platforms, but instead, yeah, if you're doing but right, but if you're doing a promotional thing, right? So if if the 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 nail salon investigative piece, if you guys put a promotional video, a 30 second, 45 second clip on Facebook, mm -hmm. and that drove people to the New York Times, and you got an ad impression or whatever, maybe that's best of all worlds, and Facebook's still happy. I don't know. But that's what we've been doing ever since Facebook allowed links. Basically, is like teasing thing, but the, mm -hmm. the reason that the, the news feed reads the way it does now, which is to say it's very like, very loud, it's, it's grabbing your attention all the time. The, the strange headlines that, that people have come up with over the last few years, <laughs> um, those are all targeted at one oddity of this whole system we have now, which is that you want people to find your content on Facebook, but you also want them to click to leave Facebook so you have to like give them a compelling headline and have them start reading something, but it has to be more compelling than the things around it. It has to, it, it's, you're, you're really trying to get that action to happen. Um, 
which is not the same as a headline that gets someone to read the story exactly. And if the ads are sold within the network, within the platform, then maybe they're more likely to just. But but these deals are not for promotional content. Right. These these deals are for right. publishing right. entire right. content in yeah. the way that in the way that Facebook started allowing its own videos. Uh, it started allowing people to, to host videos on Facebook. So for, again, for a long time, it was a great strategy for any site um, to just embed a YouTube video and then link to that on Facebook because it put the play button there and you would click and it would take you out of Facebook. It was just like this great glitch in the whole system. And I, I was reading a while ago with some, a, a discussion between uh, uh, some people who worked in, in, in the industry and someone who had worked on the Google, um, or someone who had worked in advertising at YouTube could not believe that Facebook was allowing them to um, to embed sort of like a partially functional player within the newsfeed and show Google's ads. And so that was just a matter of time before they they rectified that. But now, but now you put a you put a video uh, directly on Facebook and you cater it to the context of the newsfeed, which is to say you make it uh, appealing in. Uh, in between the other things that you would see in newsfeed, and it does so much better than the video you have to go somewhere else to watch. It's just like a, I mean, it's it's such I an obvious advantage. Probably. Well, yeah, that, that's yeah. that's the problem with the in, any of these deals is that they're they're going to work. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, you put your pre-roll ads in that video, no, right? That, that's oh, I think you can put whatever you want in that video, um, no, but if you put a pre-roll, you have to upload it. Facebook yeah, it's raw video. Player. I mean, so you can just put ads up in the video, but the the pre-roll stuff kind of kills um, sharing and engagement because, it, like, you're scrolling down your feed, you're on your phone, whatever. If you the first thing you see is an ad, you'll just keep scrolling. Um, so the the new the new term that you're hearing now is post-roll, uh, which obviously would have like. It's not as appealing to an advertiser, but in the context of a newsfeed where you want to hook people and get them started watching more than anything else, it might make sense. So I want to, yeah, I want to open it up now um, and invite you guys to ask questions. Or oh yeah, uh, Fergus back there has a microphone. So yeah. Hi, I just want to ask a question about um, one of the one of the terms you hear a lot in journalism is impact. And um, one of the things that you're describing is is an environment in which an environment that seems very intensified in terms of goal orientation. Uh, yet impact has been this kind of you know goal of journalism for many 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 years, going back maybe to the beginnings of it. Um, I'm wondering, is impact something you can ask of data? Data on impact is it something you would want to ask of data of data? Or is it something that um, should somehow remain off limits to the data environment? When you say impact, you mean that after this nail salon expose investigation that the mayor will say we need to, whatever, crack down. However you want to uh, yeah. define impact, like what, what you want your stories to mean. Yeah. I think for a while people were conflating sharing with impact in a way that was flattering to sharing, um, saying like, well, these aren't things that people just click on because they're there. There are no tricks here. These are things that people intend for other people to read. And I think given a little bit of time, that hasn't really held up. There, there are ways to incentivize people to share things that aren't at all related to like whatever, whatever idea of worthiness those previous claims were. I feel um, like that concept is mocked in the circle. Did you read the circle? No. Oh, okay. Because uh, she, I mean, she sits there thinking, like, I'm making a difference. I'm signing this petition. I'm, like, putting a heart on my Facebook feed that says that I care about this, like, as though any of that really means anything, which it doesn't. I mean, I don't think it's, I don't think any of this is off limits for data. I think it's just a harder problem. Yeah, they're actually, I'm going to take a, this opportunity to plug a forthcoming report from the Tau Center coming out in a month. Um, Michael Keller, who's back there, is working on a tool that's essentially trying to crack this nut. So uh, trying to figure out how impact can be made into data, essentially. Um, and there are some organizations that do this manually. So ProPublica, for instance, um, Dick Tofel, who, who edits ProPublica, produced a white paper about how they track impact. 
Um, and essentially, it's this very laborious process where they actually manually follow, you know, was there a hearing? Was there, I mean, and, um, and so the trick is obviously to scale that because it's not always doable. And, and so uh, you should check out news links and you should come <laughs> see uh, their event next month because they're trying to get to that. I feel like one way it gets measured is, is awards. And <laughs> awards still care about impact. So the Times, I mean, people are very aware of who has won what prestigious award. But that's its own incentive. It's the same, it's similar to Sharpie in a way where a bunch of new reporters are sitting around a newsroom looking at each other thinking, and there's a big board in people's heads thinking, yeah. oh, you've got two Pulitzers and I, and I you know, were the finalists once, but I, I've never right. really gotten to the final. Right. I have a question about the, when you were at Gawker and you were at the New York Times, if you felt the fact that their audiences might have been very different also impact the way that people read the metrics and, and it, did they or did they not? And if so, how? Um, yeah, so, well, <laughs> I would say at Gawker, um, there was, I would say that the way that they mostly thought about their audience, like they had uniques, which was their number and they cared about the number. I wouldn't say that they necessarily thought of that as like, there's a living, breathing person behind each one of these. So their interaction with their audience came mostly in the form of um, their interactions with commenters, which I didn't get to talk about today, but is a very fraught and complex uh, interaction that they have. And so they felt um, <coughs> commenters were often very, very hard on them, very harsh. And in fact, sometimes they would use metrics um, as a way to kind of make themselves feel better about getting ripped apart by commenters. So, you know, I had an editor say to me, you know, somebody's screaming at me at 7.30 in the morning on Twitter, and that happens all the time. Um, but then I look at Chartbeat, and, you know, I can't possibly be bad at my job because uh, all these other people really like it. And so, so that was kind of how they, they kind of positioned these two audiences against each other in a way. Um, there was like the mean commenting audience. Uh, not that they all were, were all mean, but, but there was a lot of mean commenters. And then there were the kind of uh, quanti quantitative, quantified audience, um, which they would look to to kind of validate themselves uh, when they were facing down criticism from the commenting audience. Um, and then at the times, I think, you know, there was, uh, there was sort of like, and Sam, I'd be curious to hear what you would say about this too. I would say people had definitely an idea of the readership in their mind, um, like, a, like a kind of like a folk understanding, like this is an educated person, this is a fairly affluent person, this is a fairly well-informed person, you know. Um, so that was, they kind of had a, a picture of that that they would draw on when they were making decisions, um, but it wasn't really so much connected to metrics in my experience or talking to people from there. Yeah, although I, I do think that when a, a time story is very popular, it sort of bursts out of the normal times reader. And I think people are aware of that, that, that the only way that you're going to get to a certain level of reach is if you uh, go beyond like the subscribers who all live in a like, 10 block radius of <laughs> right here. Yeah. The idea of looking at looking at right. metrics to like soothe your nerves after being savaged in the comments is like I, that's a kind of a bunker mentality I think because the <laughs> like the I'll, there are a number of I mean a lot of the most traffic things that we've published or that particularly that I've written have been some of the worst things that I've ever put up. Um, and if I just looked at the analytics and said, well, all these people talking about this are wrong. All these people on Twitter are like, they're just missing my point entirely. That would not foster a healthy uh, anything. Um, so there, I mean, there is always a little tiny sense of dread when something spikes on Chartbeat, <laughs> because it might be one of those. It might be the thing where Did you, you like. Spike anything? Oh, maybe this was totally bad. Oh, well, you have to eliminate that first. You like you have to make sure that oh, like we had one recently that was just a joke that didn't land with a bunch of people. I think it was a good post, but it was like like I don't know. A significant number of people are reading this. Like a lot of people read Andy Borowitz, which is as a news story from the New Yorker that they didn't read and then got shared and then like you know because it's a it it conforms to whatever idea they have about how the world should be. But if they had clicked through, they'd be like, oh God, I just shared this thing that is kind of a half of a joke. And anyway, that's, that's what you always fear with these things. It's just, it, I don't know, the, the chart beat needle is such a, the chart beat screen is such a blunt thing. <laughs> um, but yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't 
I'm not sure I would recommend that as a as a strategy for a writer. Or your former color names. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah. May I present a different approach to this issue? I'm a newspaper editor from Poland in Europe, uh, and, I, and I work for the biggest newspaper there, and I was a news editor for several years, and I introduced the measurement and the analytics devices to, and tools to, to my newsroom. And I can tell you that I'm pretty excited about what you can achieve for journalism and for your media outlet if you use the measurement uh, in the right way. Just to give you, I, I would like to give you some examples. So uh, I didn't have money to buy a sophisticated software, so we simply were using an internal software that measured the page views, so the, the most common thing we could, we could measure. And then we uh, made, made a sort of a information for a sheet every month for every journalist with an information about his stories, how his stories performed, so how many page views they had, and comparison to a benchmark within the group of journalists that were writing about a similar issue. So you, we were not comparing journalists, we were not comparing apples to, uh, to, 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 to potatoes. Yeah? So you, if you are writing about politics, national politics, you are compared to other journalists in your team. You didn't see the numbers of other journalists. You were seeing just your exact numbers and a benchmark, like an average for other journalists. So you could simply you could simply understand if you are below the average or above the average. But th this this was just a tool for editors, for example, to understand who are overperformers, who are not who are not performing very well on the internet. And of course, it's not the the only thing you use to judge uh, their performance as journalists. But we could use, for example, just conversations, uh, uh, monthly conversations with uh, journalists, editors with journalists about the, uh, uh, for example, beats to improve, the, to improve the numbers. For example, we had a uh, writer that, is, that was focusing on Syria. It's very expensive for us to have a person that is dedicated to Middle East and Syria who speaks Arabic, is traveling there. It costs enormous uh, lots of money and obviously the performance of her, st of her stories was very low. You know, over a month, she could make, let's say, the number of page views of one story about national politics. That is the reality. And I know from the New York Times I visited, and I had a chance to look at the numbers, for example, at your Syria blog. This is the major issue that nobody, or not many people, are reading the kind of, that kind of stories. But by talking with the journalists and analyzing the data, we could improve it tenfold mm -hmm. over the time. Because we could, you know, there, there were many things. There were things like you were talking about the time of publication. So, for example, she had a routine to write a daily wrap-up of events in Syria. And we just found out that the readers that are interested in that kind of stories, they don't want to read it in evenings. They prefer to read it in the mornings. Maybe they are government officials. Maybe they are NGO, NGO people from NGOs who read it when they come to work, so it's much better to publish these stories at 8 o'clock rather in the morning rather than in the evening. So that kind of stuff you can easily do after you analyze the, the, the things and you talk with the journalists about it. We could also talk about you know, the angle of stories. So the stories that, that, that had a you know, broad political angle had a different, uh, were less interesting for many re readers than stories that had an emotional angle or a personal angle. So they were simply talking about, for example, people in the fight, or uh, people, or victims, or uh, people who are escaping Syria, and so on and so on. And I don't think, you know, from the journalistic and editorial point of view, it's wrong that you tell these stories. Yeah? Uh, you know, in the in the end, we produce these newspapers to uh, to inform the public, and to inform the public, the public needs to be there. You know, so if we don't do things to attract the public to the to, the, to, the, to our publications, we are simply we don't do our job, so I don't think the journalists should be so suspicious about measurement. It's, it's, of course, there is an issue how you introduce it, how you use it, and how it affects your editorial judgment. But there is no, no really not. Uh, I, I don't think that such a suspicion that you know, in the end we will end up like in Gawker and we will be, you know, uh, following only stories about Kim Kardashian or whatever. That this is the only way it can go. You know, at my newspaper we probably have never written about Kim Kardashian, <laughs> and we use analytics a lot. 
And I don't think that our audience is looking for stories about Kim Kardashian in our, in our newspaper. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that sounds like you're doing it in a smart way, and I think that that's, um, I mean, I may be overplaying the nervousness of the New York Times people, but uh, mostly they're being careful that analytics are being rolled out in, in much that manner. So they don't want there to be a big board where people are just seeing numbers and don't have any sense of how it all compares and what the context is. So it takes time to sort of set up the right dashboard so that the right people are seeing the right things and it takes time to set up to like staff up so that there are enough people to really uh, go deep in that analysis and and go meet with editors and explain these things to them and and help them get meaningful information from it and I think that that is I'm glad that they're taking that time um, and I believe that we're on a good path toward toward something similar to what you described I think the big board, I would actually defend the big board in a way. Um, I think it's not, I think the whole system isn't in place, but I would argue for more transfer. I think everyone should have Chartbeat who works online um, as much as I complain about it. And uh, like everyone should have that privilege of complaining about Chartbeat all the time. It's like one of the, <laughs> it's like what you do at the bar with other journalists. Um, but it, it creates a new role for editors, I think, to contextualize that information and to tell people who's stories might not regularly get the traffic of their colleagues like well that's not the entire role that you you fill for us like someone working at a newspaper covering city hall might know that not quite as many people are reading those stories as might be reading something in the lifestyle section um, but they also understand that their role within this organization which has intentions beyond just gathering viewership uh, they understand that their role is, you know, important. And so I think that's something that, I mean, people complain about there being lack of editing online. I think it, it's possible there's a lack of editorial guidance as far as what analytics mean. Um, I don't, I'm not sure hiding analytics from people ultimately will, will work because people will find out. Like, well, they, yeah, and when you hide it, I mean, the, the it makes classic. It, it makes it seem like something really interesting. Right, or you can <laughs> grasp onto really weird things. Like the, the classic thing of the Times is that everyone can see the most emailed lists. So right. that's what they And that's such a weird on. metric. Right. Like who it's is like emailing? Crazy. Like it's a, that narrows your demographic a lot. It like, yeah. it, it really, if that were it's your- It's misguided too. Right, but I'm sure that's incentivized people to write. I'm sure that's been bad for some columnists, for example. I'm sure it's caused some bad column repetition. <laughs> Um, not to name not, any No. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, analytics are great. They're just like, right now, they're just this wild data that's sort of like careening through newsrooms and giving people anxiety. One final question. Do we have one? Uh, well, I, I was just going to ask Samantha. So, so, so uh, why was home section uh, uh, canceled or, or stopped? And, and then, you know, I noticed you guys brought in the men's style section on Friday. The, the digital. Uh, analytics have anything to do with that, or was that just strictly a print call? Uh, men style. This is this is, we. This is the thing. This is the thing. I could say something that gets me fired. <laughs> Knew that this could come this moment. Um, <laughs> men style was a print, a print call more than anything else. I mean, I think that actually the analytics show that our styles coverage is red about 50-50 by men and women. So the idea that we need a sec, I, I think maybe even excuse male. So the idea that we need this, like in terms of what the data is showing us is, uh, that's not the case. It's more that, that advertisers were interested in that. Um, and home is more complicated and we, we can talk about it later. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Well, thank you to these amazing panelists. So, on that note, thank you again to Caitlin, uh, John, Sam, and Chad. Um, there are still some reports at the back of the room if you want to grab them before you go out. And there is, I think, still a little wine left. So, if you had some questions that remained unanswered, um, grab them over a glass of wine and do that. Thanks very much for coming. Thank you.